and uh, the uh, party has grown to three of us. There's no way that both Sakina and myself can't possibly be talking to the Chief Justice together. I mean, this is a, a, a great moment for us, our South African Chief Justice, Mohueng Mohueng, here in studio with us having a conversation. So, yeah, Sakina, welcome to the breakfast. Well, thank you. Uh, better late than never. Exactly. <laughs> Tell me about it. So, so as, you, as you heard, and, and most people, I'm sure, before the break, we were talking more to um, your, your life growing up, who you are, how you became who you are now. But let's move into the times of uh, the, the negotiations and the formation of the Constitution here in South Africa. You were also a good key part of that. Talk to us about that. Well, I, I wasn't involved in the negotiation process. I was only involved in the, uh, in the first elections as uh, one of the fairly uh, lowly placed uh, officials. But in the process itself, I wasn't involved. You weren't involved, but you were watching from the outside, I, I thinking... I was. This was never going to actually happen. I, I was watching very keenly, and I didn't give it a chance. From the, from the moment President de Klerk announced the unbanning of liberation movements, all the way through to the release of Nelson Mandela, I thought uh, it was a setup. And I thought my suspicions were confirmed when uh, the right wing movement uh, bulldozed uh, the center for the negotiations. And two, when there was that misunderstanding between President Mandela and President de Klerk, and finally, Bui Patong and uh, the assassination of Chris Haney, I thought this was buried. The liberation movement will have to go out again and wage the liberation struggle. Wasn't I wrong? Here we are. Look at that. Amazing, isn't it? It certainly is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, talking about um, issues more contemporary and, you know, some of the issues bedeviling our country, when we look at things like poverty, and I want to start with poverty, because it's one of those poverty and inequality that leaders tend to shy away from because it's so difficult. It, it, it's endemic, it's systemic. We don't seem to know what to do about it. And you've described poverty as nauseating, yeah. poverty in Africa yeah. in particular. Yeah. Yeah. But there don't seem to be any answer. So what do we do about these nauseating levels of poverty? I think all of us who are privileged to speak to people from time to time must make the most of the opportunity, not seek to impress, but to contribute towards finding a solution to the multifaceted challenges that confront our nation. And maybe we all must come to terms with the fact that we are seriously challenged as a country. And what would perhaps help, help us to sober up is the Nigerian experience. About three, six years ago, I interacted with some senior um, citizens of Nigeria, and I was told that at the time, those who worked for government would one month get their salary and know that the next month there won't be any salary. It degenerated to the point where for three months you don't get your salary, when you next get it, it's half. Six months. And at times, people stayed up to the whole year without getting their salaries. Just make your own private inquiries about how people um, in Nigeria live, professionals. One of them was a student at the Northwest University in Mafeking, where my home is. We literally had to take money from our own pockets to feed this guy who's a lecturer at the university back in Nigeria. That's how terrible the situation can be if knowing that there are serious problems, you act as if they don't exist. And the challenge is, what is it that we can do with what we have? The starting point is what kind of vehicles, by the way, do senior officials like me, like ministers and deputies, MECs and so on, drive? And can we confidently say, the only way to drive comfortably and safely is to have these big vehicles in which we drive. And two, these uh, offices that we occupy, national departments, provincial and uh, municipalities, why do we allow this situation to go on and on 
where you pay 100,000, 300,000, 700,000 per month for a building that you could have bought many, many years back. Can't we reflect on where wastage is, even in relation to the tenders that we, we award, and, and, and make sure that we free money? There is a lot of money, I believe, but we just need to free it. I mean, you look at an institution like ESCO. What are they paying on diesel, for instance, and coal? Who are the beneficiaries? Can't we negotiate with all these service providers, not to squeeze them out of business, but to make sure that they are comfortable, but they don't make a kill? I don't think we need to be focusing on making people multimillionaires at this stage. This is the time for survival. This is the time to make sure that none of our people in a country as well endowed as South Africa with their mineral resources, that nobody have to die because of poverty. We've got to anticipate actions of a desperate people. When you push people to the point where they lose, they lose hope, they lose their sense of dignity, then anything is possible. Reflect deeply on what might be some of the contributing factors to what appears to be xenophobic uh, attacks. I'm not saying they are xenophobic, I'm saying they appear to be. And crime, what are the contributing factors? And how sustainable is this situation? What can it degenerate to if we don't do everything within our powers, throw greed out of the window and focus, not talk, focus on doing what needs to be done to arrest the situation? I think we've been talking for a long time about this. And I mean, the thing is, is that it appears that it, that it is degenerating more and more and more. You bring up ESCOM, you bring up issues that we're seeing that are happening overnight in Soweto right now. Um, we are seeing so many desperate people living in South Africa, and yet the rich are getting richer, yeah. the powerful are getting more powerful, yeah. and the poor are just being ignored. And they are taking this to heart. They are getting angry. We have a very angry society at the moment. Yeah. When is this change you're talking about actually going to happen? I, I think we're either going to make it happen as uh, the collective leadership of South Africa, and by, and by that I mean even you. You are leaders in your own right. Or we're going to leave the situation to the point where people force change down our throats. And, and that would be most unfortunate. The worst development we ever want to see is the one that such as we have seen, for instance, in Sudan recently. Let's anticipate what desperation can do and arrest the situation. I think, you know, when wrongdoing happens and it's left to be comfortable, when there is inaction in circumstances where there is a cry for urgent and meaningful action, and you'll just leave it to linger on. Nothing will happen until it is too late. So let's be vocal. Let's, let's, let us all talk about what we know to be wrong. Let me just, you know, a thought just occurred to me either last, month, uh, last night or this morning. I said, you know, there, is, there are some of the things that, are, that, are, that contribute towards the high cost of living in South Africa that we don't talk about. When there is a fuel rise, what happens? Prices of... Almost everything goes up. But when it drops, what happens? Nobody it's reduces the price. When are we going to confront these things? Because they contribute towards the high standard of living. The loaf of bread costs more. What does it do to the pocket of the poorest of the poor? When are we going to identify these things that take money out of the state, out of our pockets, in circumstances where? This could have been managed differently. I, I, I know this may generate controversy, but I think everything, whether it's about the health sector or any other sector, must be confr confronted. Where prices are, are unrealistically high, we've got to interrogate that situation. What is happening? Let us not allow ourselves to be 
uh, manipulated, you know, with some sophisticated language and allegations that, you know, you don't operate in this space, therefore you don't understand. There is nothing that affects life that we can't understand. I want to understand why Panado should be costing so much when in another nation it costs so little. Isn't it the same Panado? So there we are, we are, I like it because the president said it himself, that there's a crisis in South Africa and we all need to own up to our responsibilities to address this crisis. But part of the problem, as you correctly point out, is that we play semantics with these things. That is the problem. We call it price fixing instead of calling it what the it corruption is. that yeah. it is. Exactly. And when it comes to corruption in the South African instance, we know that it is systemic. We know it's become a culture almost. It's beyond, uh, you know, being a scourge at this point. But if we take that to the legal fraternity for a moment, the issue of corruption, and many South Africans would ask, are we equal before the law? Because we hear of this corruption. We hear of people being investigated. And, and, and we hear of them appearing in court. But beyond that, it seems that, uh, you know, they, they, there's very little follow through because we see the same people coming back, doing the same things over and over. So are we, are we equal before the law, South Africans? We are supposed to be. I think that is as far as I can take it. For us to be truly equal before the law, um, we would have to decide that nobody who is corrupt is left to look good. Because the situation throughout has been some of the people who appear to be corrupt have been identified and named and shamed. But I believe that many others have been made to look like these uh, role models that we must all look up to, when in fact there's a lot of corruption out there. And the result is there are those that you are left to talk about and to, to single out as corrupt, and you are even encouraged to do so. But there are others that you dare not touch, particularly even those who operate in the, in the private sector. Look, I don't buy to this, into this notion that uh, corruption is synonymous with operating in the public sector. It's human beings there. I also don't buy into the notion that excellence is the preserve of the private sector because it's all human beings. Why is it that uh, Ethiopia, for instance, is one of the most well-run airlines in the, in the world and it's state-owned according to the information at my disposal? What kind of human beings are running it? Why can't we have similar people running South African airways? What is the magic about the private sector that cannot be imported into, into, the, uh, into, the, into the public sector? Why is it that Emirates, which is a government project from the beginning to the end, I mean, the deputy president of the UA, UAE, who is the ruler of, of Dubai, not only conceptualized that, but made sure that he's involved in everything, including how many um, aircraft are bought and of what kind. All it ever takes for anything to run and run well is leadership. When they established uh, the administrative arm um, to serve the, the, the judiciary, apart from the Department of Justice, the Office of the Chief Justice, as a national department, I said to the officials, let us just make an example to South Africans that a government department is not inherently incompetent or inherently corrupt. Let us do everything according to, to the rules. Mm. I say, if I want something done for me, which is not in line with the prescripts, you must say no. And I announced it to all the judges. I said, nobody is going to impose his unlawful will or her unlawful will upon the officials. And the result is, ever since that national department had its own uh, budget account, last year and this year, we've had a clean audit, and uh, this year we even received an award as the best of the best among government departments. Meaning, if you just get the right people who are committed to ethics, you can get things going. So. We can turn the fortunes around even in South Africa, if only 
we don't turn a blind eye to some of the many wrong wrongs that have been done elsewhere. Accountability. Accountability. And the thing is, is that very much so what Sakina was saying right now is that is everybody equal before the law? And that I think you've given a good answer to, and the answer is it should be. But unfortunately, it doesn't appear to be that way. You know, you've mentioned SAA, you've mentioned ESCOM. We're sitting here at the SABC. Um, we've, we've seen the private sector as well involved in sure. all forms of corruption. But who... Give me one example of person or a person, an individual that has actually been held to account for the wrongs that have been done. And, and that, is, that is the wheels of justice that perhaps are not working well enough. Well, I, I, all right, now that I'm, <laughs> I, I'm op I operate in that space, let me explain. If you really want to hold a person who is involved in criminal or allegedly involved in criminal activities accountable, there are a number of, uh, of players involved. One, you need a witness. You need somebody who's not fearful, who's guaranteed of his or her safety to say, so and so has done this. Two, you need a competent investigating officer, a police person who's, who's competent and who's not going to be pressurized to turn a blind eye to some of the things that are uncovered and focus either on small things or look for a smaller fish when the investigation is revealing much more than he, was, he or she was initially told about. Three, you need an effective national prosecuting authority and ultimately you need an effective judiciary so there are a number of players here there is a need to build a strong criminal justice machinery and to inject confidence into the hearts and minds of south africans about our incorruptibility as functionaries in this space so that nobody suspects that if they were to come out and expose the corrupt or those involved in criminal activity, there are likely to be unpleasant consequences. And, and, and it takes leaders to make it happen. I can tell you this much, talking about my space. What, what I have done as Chief Justice, uh, 13th uh, uh, October 2012, I set up the National Efficiency Enhancement Committee, and it brings all these people, National Commission of Police, the Di National Director of Public Prosecutions, correctional services, health, public works, everybody, the lawyers' professions, to say what are the problems, what can we do to solve them, and to pinpoint problem areas in their own spaces, and for them to also point, pinpoint a problem areas in our, own, in our own operations so that we can have one coherent and effective machinery. Unfortunately, I only have... A, a measure of control over the judiciary, I can only suggest in relation to the other, the other functionaries. So, so, if we all do what we're supposed to do and it requires a coordinating leader, then we're going somewhere. If you have everybody at the helm of these institutions ensuring that what can be done, even with the limited resources, is being done, then we're going to get somewhere. I can tell you now, broadly speaking, I know there are exceptions. If you bring somebody before court, a case has been well investigated, and there's a, there's a competent prosecutor, you'll never come across a situation where a magistrate or a judge lets a person go because we infuse these values in our magistrates and our judges. Are they incorruptible, though? And what sort of measures have you put in place to ensure that they do not succumb to corruption, the judges, that is? Well, you know, I, 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 I think it would, really, it would really take a terribly bad human being to be a judge and be corrupt. And let me explain. We have our salaries, our benefits protected by the Constitution. Two, when I retire... I retire with my salary. When I'm home and retired, and my colleagues who are in active service get salary raises, I get salary, a salary raise even when I'm home. What reason could I possibly have as a judge to be corrupt? 
from time to time you've complete 15 years of active service there is a gratuity that you get another five years there is a gratuity and it's a decent amount i know that money is never enough but if you are not a greedy person the salary of a judge is such that you can have a very comfortable life if you're not looking for much more than what you really need so why would you be corrupt and two it's very difficult to remove a judge. It's very difficult to remove a magistrate from office. So what would incentivize you to be corrupt? All the protective mechanisms are in place to ensure our independent, uh, independence, I beg your pardon, and our ability to do our, our work as the Constitution has ordained. So some of the criticisms that, 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 that are leveled against the judiciary, and, and a lot of it we do know come from um, po politicians themselves. Let's take what, what Julius Malema, EFF leader, has to say, um, saying that the judiciary is captured, it's judges are traumatized old people is what he says, um, that they, they, they're incompetent and they should all be removed. I mean, there is no neutrality in South Africa I mean, are these, these statements unfounded? Well, uh, the judiciary has been attacked by politicians over the years. You would recall that 2015, there they were vicious attacks against the judiciary. So vicious that I had to convene a meeting of uh, all the leaders of courts and senior judges at, around Old Tambo International to reflect on this, address the media, and ask for a meeting with the president as head of state and head of the executive. And we had that meeting, which gave birth to a memorandum of understanding in relation to how the executive should relate to the judiciary. But here is the bottom line, and I'm not necessarily addressing Mr. Malema. I'm stating a principle. When people who are involved in cases are unhappy with the outcome, they, crave, they cry foul. They attack. When the shoe pinches, people react. And uh, quite often they react in a less, less than ideal manner. But the bottom line is judges are doing their work well. I'm sure they, there may be some, some exceptions here and there, but I'm certainly not aware of any weak, incompetent, or traumatized judge. And if there be any captured judge, we are begging the public, come with the evidence, submit the evidence to the Judicial Conduct Committee, whose responsibility it is to hold accountable any judge who is captured, which means any judge who is corrupt. Produce the evidence. It doesn't help much to make uh, wild uh, allegations. Come up with the evidence. Produce it. Well, of course, uh, so much more that we still would love to talk about, uh, but we have to go to news and we'll continue this conversation and wrap it up after the news break. But for now, let's go to our 8 o'clock news bulletin.